Welcome, friends, to this uh, monthly meeting that we have every month so that we can get together and get back on track on our spiritual journey. The way our minds operate, we get so distracted in our daily work, daily duties, that we need to meet again just for the sake of coming back on track. That is why they say there's an importance of something called satsang. Satsang is translated as the sung of the sat, which means the company of the truth, that where we share the truth. The truth is not easy to share. It's easy to experience, but very difficult to describe, because we are living in a state which we think is our only reality. And the fact is, this is the most unreal of all realities created in this universe. There are far greater realities that exist, and we are not aware of them, so we take this as our only reality. Therefore, we are far from the truth. The truth is that we don't belong here. Our souls, our consciousness, does not fit in here. There is too much of duality here, too much of pain and suffering. When you look around in this world, and I get a chance to meet people individually and personally, I see how miserable people are living in this world which they think is the only reality. Our own reality is very superior because there is no suffering there. And we do not have pairs of opposites which we have here. And yet, just because we are not aware of that reality, we are taking this to be the truth, that this is, we are living in a real true world. To share, to share the information about the truth, we have this information gathered together on meetings, which we call satsangs. This is a monthly satsang, so we can find out what the truth is. The truth is that our true home is not here, but can be discovered while we are still here. And it can be discovered when we are human beings. It cannot be discovered in any other form of life. There are lots of forms of life. And life is a force. Life is a force which we call the soul. A soul creates life. We all have souls. That is why we are living. But plants also have souls. They are also living. They also grow. Insects, birds, animals, they all have souls. But none of them have the opportunity to find the truth. Human beings have the possibility of finding the truth, of their own true home. The true home is called such kinds, which means the true home, literally. The true home can be discovered while we are in the human body because the way to discover it lies inside and not outside. As a very big factor. If we had to travel somewhere to find our true home, it would be a long, big journey. But when we have to find the true home within ourselves, it's not a long journey at all. It's no journey at all. It's just opening up our inner windows and see what else exists inside us besides what we have been looking outside. All our life, we spend our time looking outside. All our life, we get attached to things outside. All our life, we're desiring things outside. This is so much of a distraction taking place outside, we totally forgotten what is inside. We don't even know what inside means. We think that the inside must be inside some place. And how can we say it's inside our own self? Where is the place for inside? It's very difficult to define something that the mind cannot explain. And I'll tell you the reason why mind has a big limitation. There is no description possible of something that is not in time and space. Time and space are a means through which we have an experience generated by the mind. If there was no mind, there would be no space and time. I can tell you that. There will be no experience. Mind creates space and time and creates an experiences which can be spread out over here and there, past and present and future. So the mind is at work inside and creating an experience for us 
and we take the experience to be a reality and we merely experiences of a already existing reality. We totally forget that we create the reality with our mind. Now, when we try to describe our true home, which exists zero time, zero space, mind can't understand it nor describe it. It's a big limitation. If I were to say that the whole of the creation that you see at any level of consciousness is all originating from our true home where there is zero time and zero space, it's impossible to understand it. Buddha said, the truth is we come from a state of shonya, state of zeroness, not emptiness, state of nothingness. He distinguished between nothingness from emptiness. He said nothingness is not empty, it contains everything. Mind can't understand it. If Buddha discovered that mind can't understand it, Buddha stopped talking about the nothingness and the origin of the universe, began to talk of the eightfold path, do rightful thinking, do rightful action, do these things, began to teach something that people could understand. There is a correspondent who has written to me emails, six emails, saying he's I'm devastated by some truth he read in some literature. In one of the saints says that he cannot tell the truth. It's too blunt, nobody can understand it. And that particular saint says he went to great master Baba Savan Singh, my master, and said, Master, I don't want to carry on this work of initiating people and trying to explain the truth. I only speak the blunt truth, nobody can understand it. I should stop doing this work. Great master, advise that other master. Continue to do your work fearlessly. A time will come when people will understand the truth. Meantime, tell them the stories about the truth. And they may like the stories, but they will find the direction. The direction is in the same, inward, and not outside. So at least they will find the direction inside. Describe to them beautiful stories of what is happening, but truth cannot be understood. And he wrote in his book that I consulted Baba Savan Singh, great master, who is a true man, and even he says he can't speak the truth because people can't understand it. So therefore, nobody can speak the truth and understand it. If this is the situation, what are we doing in a satsang trying to share a truth which nobody can understand? But the only thing we can understand is which direction to take to find that truth which can't be described. The direction is simply going inwards within our own self. When I say inwards towards our own self, first question is, where is that self? Is it in our hand? Is it somewhere in our house? Think where is the self which speaks, which thinks, which acts? Where is that self? Obviously, it is not outside of the body. While we are in a human body, it is not outside of a body. It's inside the body. Where in the body? People say, maybe it is in the heart chakra, maybe it is in this center. There are several centers of energy in our body. And we think that because our body is functioning through the energetic experiences of those centers, maybe our self is lying there. But when we say it is lying in the centers, where are we saying it from? Not from the centers, never. We are saying it from our head where we are thinking and talking. It doesn't take very long to find out that currently we think that if we are not a body but using a body, living in the body, the location of our own self is somewhere in the head, not in the rest of the body, which is the truth. The truth is that we as a life force are living in this body, using this body from a location right inside our head, right behind these eyes. You could just close your eyes and say, where am I actually operating from if I'm just an operator of the body? you find that you operate from the brain, you operate from the head. It doesn't take long to find that out. Then if we have localized our self, go within to the self, as within the physical body, 
then exactly we are in the physical body. If we contemplate deeply, with eyes closed so we don't look outside, ears closed, we don't hear outside, quiet place so no disturbance is there, and we contemplate where exactly are we thinking from? Where exactly are we asking this question from? We find that the question is being asked, right? The, the words of thought are being heard right in the center, behind the eyes, between the ears, absolute center. The best possible place, the most well-protected place in the human body, protected by your skull, protected by gray matter, protected in the best possible way, near certain organs called the pineal gland and the pituitary body, which is located in the absolute in the center, which I am describing. And it appears that biologically, those centers are also acting to produce all the hormones that are being used by the rest of the body, including all the energy centers. It's amazing that here science and our knowledge of where we are spiritually coincide. They are both operating from the same place. Having found this, it's a big discovery. We know that whoever the self is, at this time, in a physical body, we are operating from a single point. Behind the eyes, between the ears, in the center. If we close our eyes, can we feel it? If we close our eyes at where we are, we close our eyes, say, are we inside the head? Are we looking at the back of the eyes? Can we feel where the ears are? Supposing we do this little exercise, that where are we if we are really there? Can we move inside? Can we use imagination to check out whether we can move imaginatively inside our head and figure out where we are? We can do it. And every time you will do it, you will hit a spot. You move upwards and downwards in the head, forwards and backwards. You hit a spot. You say, that's where I am. The rest I was looking at. The rest I was feeling around me. That spot is the most wonderful spot. It's the entry door to new realities. Entry door to finding something far more than we have been experiencing outside. Far more real than anything we have ever seen inside. One single spot can give us this information. All we have to do is to not think of other things. Not think of other things outside, but think of that. Think of that spot. That spot has been called a third eye center. It will be called the point. It will be called Nukta, the point. The point where we reside. The point where self resides in a physical body. If the self is not the physical body, we know where it resides, where it operates the physical body from. Not the whole brain, it's just a function from the spot. The spot decides everything. The spot makes us think. The spot makes us have all sensory perceptions. Spot makes us have a knowledge of the world through the body, and the spot is where our self is. When we say, let us go into ourself, very easy, go there. What could be simpler than that? What's the problem then? If the spiritual journey means going to that spot inside, where's the problem? Why are we struggling? Do you need any struggle to find out where you are? If I were to say this body is my own self, I'm sitting on this chair in this hall, and I want to know where am I sitting? I know where I'm sitting, because that's from where I'm talking, that's from where I'm operating. We are doing the same thing inside the body, exactly from the center. It's only a question of removing the distractions that we have ourselves created through our thinking process. When we think, we always think of something outside. We always think of our desires, attachments outside. That is why we are not aware of where we are. If we can momentarily say, let's not think of anything else except 
where are we, where do we belong? Close our eyes through the years, be in quiet place. Say, where am I operating from? We'll come to where we are. We have not to find something external to ourselves. We have to find our own self. And I'm emphasizing this point because a lot of people think we have to imagine somebody which is the same sitting there. And therefore, we have to close our eyes and imagine somebody sitting. And we say, there is some little fellow sitting and we are seeing there little being sitting there. And that must be ourself. Can't be ourself if we can see it. If you can see it, we are the one seeing, not the one we are seeing, the little image we are making. People have spent years and years trying to make these images and thinking we are looking at the self. You can't look at the self. If supposing in the physical body, I want to look at my eyes, I can't look. I can see a reflection in the mirror. Nobody can see their own eyes. In the physical body, nobody can see the inner eyes. One can know that you have eyes. You can know you can see things with the eyes. And yet we make this big mistake thinking we can see ourselves sitting there. No, you can experience yourself sitting there. You can feel you are sitting there. But it does not mean that you have to see anything. You see what is around you. Just like we are in the physical body seeing what is around us. The only thing is don't see anything other than what is around you there. Supposing you don't see anything. Supposing you see darkness, we have some wonderful systems with us that we can convert darkness into light. Anytime, anywhere, everybody can do it. How does it happen? Start imagining. If you close your eyes completely, tightly, put all the kind of bandages on yourself and imagine your friend is there, you'll see the friend. Where is that friend coming? How can you see without light. How can you see anything through imagination? Because imagination is tied up with the inner self, not with the body. And we forget that part. That imagination is a function not of the body. It's a function of our inner self. When we imagine something, I had a meditation class going on. I said, there are some light switches we have here that if you put the Button up, the light goes higher. Put the button down, the light goes down dimmer and lighters. Can you imagine one exists inside? Total eyes closed. They imagined there was a light. I said, now see how much light dark? Make it bright. Right? Became very bright. More bright. They took it higher and higher till they saw light that they never seen outside. Can you do that by imagination? That to create this much of light just by imagination? Of course you can. Imagination does not operate from physical systems. It's operating from your inner astral self, a self that generates all your sense perceptions, a self that makes you see. If the eyes were the only one to see, you could see nothing in imagination. If eyes were the only one to see, you could never have a dream and see anything. These eyes are not functioning when you're seeing in dreams. These eyes are not functioning when you're seeing in imagination. These eyes are not functioning when you see the inner self, yourself. That is why it's a great aid to us that we can enter the area where we are operating this body and not the body. It's a big discovery that we are not the body. We are using the body. The body is like a costume. We are wearing clothes here. We don't become the clothes. We know this is our jacket. This is my clothes, I'm shirt, I'm wearing a shirt. I can never say I'm the shirt. But unfortunately, with the body, you say that is myself. No, it's not the self, it's the body we are using. Starting from that point, if you can go within that point, wonderful experience. The closer you are to the center, the more wonderful the experience. Now I must tell you, some ordinary mistakes people make when they try to do this exercise of being at the center, being at the dot, being at the nukta, being at the third eye center, common mistake. They try to associate this body with the seeing, and therefore they try to see with the eyes, 
imagination, eyes, and they're always very close to the eyes, not at the center. And people sit there for a long time, that we are waiting to see something. But if you see, imagine where you are, where are your ears? Oh, they're way back. You can know that. Now you've wasted your time thinking that you are at the center. You are too much forward. But if you know that you have to be at the center, you can have to do an exercise inside and jump backwards. You will be surprised how much agility you have. The inner self can be any, any self. You can make yourself a cloud. You can make yourself a baby. You can make yourself an old person. You can make yourself anything you like because imaginary. You are using imagination to express the self. Just you are using this body to express the self. Inside you can imagine who you are. Supposing you imagine you are the same being, like you are outside, same face that you have outside, and you have, and you are inside, and you imagine you are in the center. What will happen if you concentrate your attention there? You will forget you are in the head. You will think what is happening around me. That becomes yourself. You are then looking around. The space expands. There's a few inches only right now. And the experience will expand the space. You can accommodate anything into it. You can make it a nice living room. Put a lot of furniture there. Imagine me. You a nice place to be in. Develop the place with your own ideas. And start living in that place. And say, this is a great place to be in. That is the place to meditate in. Not outside. If we are saying that the truth is lying inside and not outside, how can we take a special chair from the market and say, this is my meditation chair, and sit on the chair, my special chair I use for meditation? They're meditating on the chair. They're meditating on something outside. Why can't you have a chair inside, which is much easier to imagine than to buy one? Make a chair of your own inside. Print your space for it. You want to have a large place to live in? You want to meditate in a garden? Make a garden. Grow plants. Grow flowers. Not outside. Inside. Use imagination to draw your attention inside. The whole game of discovering yourself is based upon the use of your attention. If somebody were to give me what's the most greatest wealth we have been given by the Creator, I would say the greatest wealth is attention power of attention. Because what we are seeing around ourselves, we can't change. What we are aware of, we can't change. But where we put attention, we can change. I am now seeing all of you. I also have, from the side of my eye, I can see beautiful flowers on my side. I can look at the flowers and start enjoying them. Say, wow, beautiful flowers. Now, when I'm looking at the flowers and enjoying them, I'm partially unaware who's sitting there. If I keep on looking at the flower, I'll be unaware who's sitting here. This is a great miracle that we have the power of using attention which can be concentrated wherever we like. When you concentrate your attention, you can become unaware of other things. That's the beauty of the power of using attention and concentrating it. Now think of it, that we locate ourselves behind the eyes and concentrate our attention on being there and having beautiful flowers there, having flowers all around you there, having beautiful decorations there, all involved in that thing. What are we really doing? I'm drawing your attention there. Is there any difficulty? No, very easy. But something will make it a little difficult. Our thinking mind will say, let me think of outside flowers. Let me think, why are you thinking of these flowers? Because they also are outside flowers. It will distract us. It will distract and try to take our attention out. That's the only problem. Another problem in meditation. Distraction by the mind is the only problem. Otherwise, it's the easiest thing to do. It's a natural thing for us. It's built naturally into us. The, we did not come here to stay here. Permanently, our body doesn't stay long, it dies away. Even an inner, inner bodies also die away, we can find out. Even the mind dies away at a certain point. We are not uh, we are not here to
to experience the temporary stay anywhere, we are here permanent. We are permanent people, permanent souls. We were never born, never died. We came for temporary experiences. So that is why when we want to find the true self, which never dies, which can always be aware of whatever is happening at any stage, and they're sitting right there, let's build everything around there. Plenty of space. So long as you remain in the center to start with, not forever, because the center to start with is still associated with your knowledge of the physical body and the head. But once you start building things there, your attention gathered in new things you are doing, so you know what you can do? You can do anything you want at that point. You can dance, you can sing, you can write books. You can do anything you want, which you are doing outside, you can do inside. Occupy your time doing things inside and draw your attention to that so that you forget what is happening outside. At least for some time, set apart some time, two, three hours is not much out of 24 hours. If you can play this game of finding out what you can do inside and do it, you will be amazed that you will not only be unaware of what is happening outside, you will be unaware of this body, and that will be your awareness. It will open up the whole new world of a greater reality that you can see outside. It's possible for everybody. Why I bring this message to you is, these are steps to discover the self. These are not steps to discover new experiences. New experiences, yogis can teach us. They can teach us by concentrating attention on the energy centers. New experiences can come. I've tried them out. They can very new experiences. How does a new experience give you information or knowledge of your own self? How do you get to know the experiencer just by new experience? Never. You must turn to the experiencer. Who is having the experience? New or old? Doesn't matter. But we are so concentrating on experience. People come and say, do you know I was able to see some red light and some blue and some white dots I saw in meditation? I'm very happy. I said, I knocked you on the head, you'll see the same things. <laughs> what is it? Are you, have you finding anything about yourself? You see wonderful things inside. You have great dreams. Have you found out who you are? Not at all. The spiritual journey is to the self. Go within yourself, and not to the experiences. And we lay so much in emphasis on experience, you forget the experience. And the truth is that the discovery of the reality will come when you find the experience. The experience is generating the whole experience. And that we don't know right now. We think experience is only come to experience what's already there. It's not true, but you can find it from going inside to the self. So that is why they say self-realization is a secret of even God-realization. If you don't discover the self, you have discovered nothing. New experiences mean nothing. They can just highlight that you are curious people. They can show that you are curious about new experiences. So what? Baba Fakir Chand, that saint, he said, I have done meditation for hours and hours, had all inner experiences, went to the highest level of experience which they have described in the books and the literature. And suddenly I realized I was no more enlightened than I was to start with. I never found who was having the experience. I was just looking at the experiences. I thought I was rising high in my consciousness. Never discovered the truth. The truth was discovery of the self, which he says he discovered much later when he found that he is being manifesting in his disciples. The disciples say, you came and helped us. He says, how could I help him? What is helping the, a disciple comes? Baba Fakir Chans, one lady, he was living in Usharpur. I had a chance to see him many times. There was a lady disciple of his. She was sleeping at night, and she had extreme pain in the stomach. And she prayed that I'll die with this pain. 
and Baba Fakir Chand, her master, appeared, physically saw, saw, and he said, don't worry, daughter, there is a little black salt lying on that shelf there, go mix with the water, and take it, you'll be all right. She went up, he disappeared. He went up, picked up the black salt from the shelf, and put in the water, and the pain disappeared. Early morning, she lived in the same town, Usharpur. Early morning, she ran to the master to thank him. Said, Master, thank you for coming last night and helping me. He said, please forgive me. I never go to ladies' bedroom that night. <laughs> please don't make these kind of statements. You did come. I saw you. On that, Baba Fakishal says, so many people told me this thing that I began to wonder, how can I be appearing? I am sitting here. How can I appear somewhere else? Then my discovery started. Who am I that I can appear like this? Then I discovered that the higher experience I was having were experience of myself being the same as that lady, being myself the same as everybody. I discovered that the origin was only one, that we were all the same. Then I discovered the reality of my own self. I discovered the reality from that lady. I discovered the reality from these experiences of people. Not mine, here I saw so many experiences. Then I discovered the fact that originally our soul is only one soul, total soul. There's only one state of consciousness from which the whole drama is taking place. But we think we are separated here, therefore we can't understand that. We can't understand our oneness from where the origin came. That was my real knowledge, that was the truth. That is where we belong, that's our true home, where everything is one. And I couldn't explain it, couldn't understand it. The truth cannot be explained. But I discovered from an experience of other people. He tried to explain this thing. People say he didn't know anything. Because he says, I didn't know anything. I learned from others. Then what kind of a perfect living master was he if he himself is saying, I know nothing? There is a biography of his. The title of the book is The Unknowing Saint. And he claimed all the time, I know nothing. I attended one of his talks, his discourses in Oshadpur, where one of his disciples who had also become a saint, Sant Tarachan. Saint Tarachan was also enlightened, like this man. And he came 300 miles from Rajasthan someplace to visit him because it was a festival. And he was speaking on a festival. So he made some Sarajan sit next to him on the stage. So both were sitting on the stage. We were listening to him. And Baba Fakir Chan started off, you know, we know nothing. I know nothing. It's only in your own self that you see everything. The truth is inside you, not outside, not even in me. I have no knowledge. He gave a discourse as usual. And he said, I'm very happy Sarajan is also here. And he'll say a few words. And Sarajan said, don't believe this man. He's telling his own master. He said, don't believe this man. If he really knew nothing, I would not travel 300 miles to come and lay my head on his feet. Everything I got is from him. But what he's explaining cannot be easily understood. He's explaining that the truth is that what we think is coming from outside is also coming from inside. The truth is the whole creation is coming from inside out. We can't explain it. And that is why we don't understand. And therefore he's saying that he knows nothing as a human being acting like a human being, like anybody else. These perfect living masters with the highest knowledge have never said they are masters. They have said they are servants of masters, servants of people. They call themselves like that because they understand that it's not the physical body. We go and see somebody we want to get guidance from. A perfect living master will never say, okay, follow me and I'll give you guidance. He says, go inside yourself to find the guidance. He will even say, the one you're looking for outside is also inside. A real master is inside. A real master ultimately is our own self. Because there's no other. The real master is our own true self. We can't see, we are not experiencing it. Therefore, he appears as a master independent from us inside. Therefore, he appears as a human being outside, not because he's outside. He's always inside. 
but we never see inside. It's dark. We close our eyes. Our whole attention is outside. Therefore, he appears in a human form outside. And he's like an ordinary person outside. What does he do as an outside person, ordinary person, like anyone else, sometimes more ordinary than most of us ordinary people? How can an ordinary person living an ordinary life, being born and dying like us, getting sick like us, getting medical treatment like us, eating food like us, how can such a person affect us? What is his role? If the real master is inside, what is this outside man's role at all? The role is very simple. The role is that he is carrying with him, as a human being, an awareness of that oneness, which we are not. Know the difference. Can you imagine there is no other difference? He is just an ordinary person. Awareness is how much he knows at any time. He knows everything, how the creation is taking place, why it is taking place, why we are all separated, what is the purpose of our separation, why duality is created, why we are having all these experiences. He is aware 24-7. And not that he has got enlightenment sometime and is coming to tell us about it. He is never a teacher. There's thousands of teachers who can teach the same thing. He doesn't come to teach anything. He comes to find out which soul, not the body, not the mind, not karma, not destiny, which soul, the living force, which is now caught up in these experiences, had decided that it is enough for me, I want to go back to a true home. And in that oneness, he is appearing as separate and is helping us to reach that oneness. Therefore, his role is very simple. His role is, we are the same and I can show you we are the same. But to show that we are the same, we are believing, let, it, let us be convinced first with our mind. Explain, tell us what to do. If he says, do nothing, we will say, can't be a master, can't be a teacher, he is doing nothing. He said, do nothing. The truth is, he is saying, do nothing. What he is doing is, he is drawing us towards himself, outside, so that he can draw us inside by a power that exists beyond the mind and comes directly from the soul. And that happens to be the power of love. The power of love, true love, which pulls us into oneness. Nothing pulls us closer. No magnetism, magnetism exists in this world which can pull closer than love. The stronger the love, the higher it comes from, the greater the pull. We can experience that particular pull even in that person who is the most ordinary person here because that pull is coming from beyond the mind and is not pulling our mind, not pulling our body, not pulling our senses, pulling our soul. The life force itself, which we believe is separated. Because we believe it's separated, he's come to show it's not separated. Spiritual journey is not a journey. Spiritual journey is to know, to have the awareness of our own truth, our true home, where we belong, where we came from, just for an adventure here. If we are tired of this adventure, we begin to have some feeling in us called seeking. We seek something. Sometimes we know what we are seeking. Sometimes we don't even know what we are seeking. Missing something, we feel we are missing something. We don't know exactly what we are missing. But we are missing something. We have tried everything. We have met friends. We have made company. We have followed books. We have followed teachings. We have followed yoga. We have followed everything. Something is missing. We don't know what is missing. When such a person comes in our life, it looks like this is something we were missing. We still don't know what it is. What we are really missing is something that we all the soul craves for. To love and to be loved. To love and to be loved because love is a reality of the oneness. It's not coming from the mind. You cannot think out and make love. Create love by thinking. Create love by talking. Create love by writing. No. 
soul experiences love all the time. When it misses it, feels alone. Can you imagine I meet thousands of people during my visits to various countries? I have not visited one country where people did not tell me in their interviews that they are not lonely. Everybody is lonely. People have friends, people have families, people have their spouses, they have companions, and still they feel lonely. How can you feel lonely when you have so much company around? Company is somewhere, scanty. It's just at a physical level. It does not seem to touch. Sometimes we think the mind is touching each other. Our thinking is similar. Even that is very difficult. But the experience of missing true love, everybody has. A perfect living master comes here, ordinary person, and something happens to us which is touching our soul. Because that's what he's come for. Because the soul has decided to seek to go back to true home. Soul is fed up with this experience. Then only such a person appears in our life. Doesn't appear otherwise. If we're enjoying our life, enjoy. Your time is not up yet. When that feeling will come, I am done with this. This is not my place. I don't feel like it. I've had enough of it. Seeking of that starts and such a person appears in our life. We can't find such a person. Because when we find, we have no criteria from which to judge. But when such a person appears in our life, then we can start judging. There's something happening to us. Is he a greedy person and wants some money from us? No, he doesn't. If he does, rule him out. He's not performing any miracles for us to see. He sometimes shows us one little glimpse of something and we say, that's right and never shows us again, plays games like with us. How come? What is he doing? Yet, we can't get away. Great master's time. See, my master's picture, I remember. From one intellectual professor having big discussions. He came, he said, Master, I don't believe a word of what you are telling people. I think you're misleading people. What you are talking of Inner regions and inner things, every mind can make it up by imagination, by suggestion. You suggest to a person something, hypnotic suggestion is creating all these things what you're talking about. In nonsense, why are you talking to them like this? Great Master said, Professor, you have a right to your opinion. I have a right to my opinion. My opinion is based on my experience. Your opinion is based on your opinion. I'm not trying to persuade you on anything. I am saying, you are a good professor. Teach. Teach what you know. Professor went away. Next week he came again. He said, I want to tell you, Master, that I don't believe anything you say. And I want to tell you this very straight. Oh, thank you. You also told me last week. I'm very happy. You come to tell me again. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Professor went away. Third week he came again. He said, Master, I want to tell you, I don't believe your stuff. He said, if you don't believe my stuff, why do you keep on coming to me again and again? He said, Dad, I don't know why I'm coming. <laughs> Something is happening that in spite of my disbelief, in spite of my doubts, I still like to come and see you. I don't know what's happening. Then Great Master explained, these are two separate functions of something we are all endowed with. We all have a soul. And we all have a mind. They don't work together. The soul wants to go to true home. The soul wants to be loved. The mind wants to argue. The mind wants to learn. The mind wants to teach. The mind wants to struggle. The mind wants to work. Soul does not. We all have the two things inside us. You are telling me by your mind you don't accept what you are saying. Your soul is still being pulled. You bow to the master, please. For, let me follow you now. I'll deal with my mind. Not easy. He said, it's not easy to deal with the mind. Don't think it's easy at all. Many people have tried. One great soul, one great mystic said, if somebody came and told me that he has drunk the water of all the oceans, it's impossible. For one moment I might believe such a person might have come. If somebody says I've picked up all the mountains of the world on my head, I know it's impossible. 
for one moment, I'll probably accept it. But if somebody cares, I've come and controlled my mind, I'll say, never, never, never. Mind is so difficult to control. Mind will keep on thinking. Mind will keep on doubting. Mind will keep on creating fear. It's trained to do that. It is meant to do that. It is designed to do that. Why are we trying to change something, a machine given to us, designed to do something? We don't have to change it. We have to ignore it. It's working. Fine. The mind says, I don't believe it. Okay, you don't believe, but I do. I am not you. Now, that's the big issue. Biggest issue in meditation and the spiritual path is how to recognize what is the mind, what's your soul. If you can do that, you won half the battle. And I'll tell you how to recognize. Because those two function very differently. The mind works only in time and space. Even the smallest thought takes time. The soul works without time, spontaneously. The mind reasons and creates doubt by reasoning. Soul does not. Soul accepts what it experiences. The mind from doubt creates fear. Soul does not. Soul appreciates beauty. In one go, you have something beautiful, it strikes the soul as beautiful, not by thinking about it. If you think about it, it may become less beautiful. Soul has an experience of a state of bliss, happiness, which comes suddenly, not by thinking, mind has to think about things. Main distinction, soul's functions. The greatest function is the experience of love. The soul experiences love, and can love and can be loved. Soul only does that, not the mind, not the body, not the senses. That is why very clear distinction between the soul. Soul is spontaneous. Soul's knowledge comes from intuitive gut feeling, sudden feeling, this is it. Not by thinking what should be it. So many times in our life, we have a feeling, I should not go there. Mind says, why not? I should not, something, something is telling me I should not go. Where is that something coming from? That intuitive knowledge comes from the soul. Then we decide, okay, let's go. We have an accident. We should have listened to our gut feeling. So many times it's happened in our life. Therefore, the functions of two are separate. And can we have a better idea of the soul and the mind? Yes, in meditation, you can have a still better idea. In meditation, you can Sit and listen. Listen to your thoughts. That's the mind. The mind is always thinking. It never stops. If it stops thinking, it will die. And we die with it. The mind never stops thinking. Therefore, any time you want to sit in the head, you can hear the thoughts. Mind thinks. Mind speaks. Soul never thinks and never speaks. But soul listens. Soul listens, mind speaks. Big difference. Therefore, in meditation, when you are at the third eye center inside the head, relax there and listen to your mind. See, don't tell the mind what to think. Listen to the mind. And you'll find you are not the mind. It's like a machine given to you. Very beautiful machine, very computer-like. It's the greatest computer that you can generate. Is our own mind. And you can work it, use it, use it for thinking what you want to think. That's not how we are leading our lives today. We are identifying ourselves with the mind. We don't see the difference. I am thinking, not a true statement. I am using my mind to think. I want to think about this visit here. Okay, I can use my mind to think about the visit or not think or think of something else. It's a machine given to me to use. But we are identifying ourselves that we are the thinkers. No, we can think we are the life force that makes the mind work. We are the power. Mind is computer, you unplug it, it doesn't work. We are plugging our life, the soul, into the mind to make it work. And we can use it any way we like. 
So when I say we can use it anyway, who is that we? Who is that I? Who is that self that can use the mind? That's the soul. How can soul which does not speak only listens? How can it give a command to the mind? It gives commands from the intuitive knowledge that it always has. It gets the gut feeling, intuitive knowledge, tells the mind to work on that. Whole life changes. You know, you can change your life overnight if you want, just by using your spiritual will based on intuitive knowledge and instructing your mind to do what your spiritual will says and not for the mental will. But that's what we are doing. If you analyze your life, all the problems are coming because we are following the mind's will and not asserting our own will, soul's will. The soul's will is also expressed through the mind. The mind is very useful if you use it. It's horrible if you follow it. And we are all following it. Therefore, we become slaves of our minds. Something given to us, such a wonderful gift to use, to think, to communicate, to read, to understand. Such a beautiful gift. And we are following the gift to lead our lives. Big mistake. Look back on your life, how mistaken we were by listening to the mind instead of telling the mind what to do. So, to how to develop spiritual will is a big subject. And in meditation workshops, certainly, I lead you on through these things, stages, how to develop spiritual will and distinguish clearly between the spiritual will, which makes you the master of your mind, how to use it, and the mind's will, which is just leading you astray. Because the mind's will is dictated clearly by its desires and attachments. The mind has become a slave of another thing. We have become slaves of the mind, and the mind has become slaves of desires and attachments. We are completely lopsided. The whole life has become, oh, this is the only thing we have outside, and we know nothing about inside, and we have no time for inside. What a strange situation we are in. Great Master, you tell the story of a king who had a beautiful daughter, the princess. And he was hoping the princess would marry a prince and have a happy life to live ever after. But she fell in love with a street sweeper who was sweeping the streets out as some low fellow. And when she married, the king said, she's fallen in love with that man, what can I do? She wants to follow that man, I can't stop her. And she went with that guy. And when she married and got there, she found the guy was not interested in her at all. He was going to prostitutes, not one or two, five prostitutes he was going to. Her life was miserable. That is our life. Our soul was a beautiful princess. Our one creative power was the creator of the king. The soul was, why was the soul created? I must tell you, some people ask this question, that if we have only one, why did we become many souls to start with? The answer is very simple, but you have to examine it. The one is love, not lover or beloved. Love is one. It became more than one soul that love can be lover and beloved. That's how the whole creation is taking place based on this. Do we start from love? Love is love. It doesn't make you a lover. To experience a separation has been caused within the one. And the same one that persi persists right up to here. The division took place like that for love to become an experience. Other is love. So, but the souls, because they are in that state of love, therefore, when they come here, they are supposed to be having love with soul. Great idea. But the soul falls in love with a sweeper like a mind. And the mind doesn't love the soul. The mind loves sense perception, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, by prostitute. That's our tradition. That's how we used to describe this in the story. We are doing everything toxic early. Let gas get back into control and see what we came for. We came for an adventure into new experiences. And the adventure ends, we go back home. We go to see a movie. We don't want to own the things in the movie. Here we try to own things. We want to make things our own. My house, my car. Everybody dies. 
and neither the car goes or the house goes with them. And we are trying to make things and people our own every day. And none of them become our own. Why can't we see this? Don't we see everybody dies? Has anybody ever lived forever? These great saints and masters came. They all died like any one of us. And still we tend to make things our own. It's like going to a movie and say, I like this scene, it's mine. This chair is mine. I want to carry them. You don't carry them. You come back home after the show. We came here for a show. I have to go back home. So that is why these teachings that these masters come and give us are for our soul, not for the mind, not for the body, not for the senses. They find out souls is now seeking to go back home and they come and say, you are ready? I'll take you back home. Period. The mind comes and says, but first we have to learn how to go back home. All right, meditate. But we should know how to discipline ourselves. This is very hard. You know, we know discipline is very important. Okay, avoid this diet, follow this rule, follow this rule. Mind says, now I can see there is some pathway. It's all for the mind. Mind is the one that's obstacle. And mind is being fed with all these teachings. But we don't realize when a perfect living master comes into our life, and say, I accept you, our journey is over. But we still think the journey has begun. Because we don't know. One day we will find out. The journey ended when we met the protected master and he said, I accepted you, we'll go together. I'm very happy that you came and joined me today on this monthly meeting. And I'll see you briefly after lunch break. And then I'll see a few people. Some new people have come. I'd like to see them one-on-one. -on -one. And we have those interviews after that. Thank you very much for joining me.